always, um, actually, I'm going to move this camera. As always, the camera is in a different spot. <laughs> I'm going to um, start doing some playing as I get started here. Thanks for joining me. I don't think you need to see the bass drum. Let's see if that stays put. So I haven't, uh, <clears throat> I haven't had a chance to play yet today. So I thought it was a good opportunity to actually show you, you um, a lot of people ask warm up, whatever. <clears throat> Typically, when I first sit down at the kit, whether it's for the day or whatever, I actually play first. I don't play something fast. I don't play something where I'm tense. Um, I usually put on a record that I know really well, where I can sing a lot of the solos, you know, rhythmically at least, something I've listened to a lot. And if I put it on and I play along with it, sometimes with sticks, sometimes with brushes. Today's going to be brushes because, uh, well, I just have this little tiny Bluetooth speaker. So it's not very loud. So if I had a, a way to play louder things, um, even though this thing is hooked up, I can't. Anyway, it's a long story. But today is brushes. Today is uh, Michael Brecker. The album is Tales from, Tales from the Hudson. This is the second track, and it is called... Um, not that one. It's called Midnight Voyage. Just a swinger, Jack DeJanet, Michael Brecker, Pat Metheny, uh, Joey Calderazzo on piano. And I'm just going to get my limbs and everything warmed up. As always, um, if you're joining live, please chat any question you have about what you're practicing, what you're working on, any question you have about any drum thing related to me, totally fine. I'm going to play a little bit of brushes, get my hands moving. And um, the reason I'm playing with something that I know is that I'm also trying to, like, artificially manufacture interaction. So because I know this record so well, a lot of the, the solos rhythmically, I know where there's these gaps, right? Where, like, Michael Brecker will end a phrase. So, I'm going to add interaction in these scaps, even though I know most of them are coming because I know the record so well. That's totally fine. Then, as you start practicing along with recordings you don't know, and you can still maybe listen to the solo's phrases and play simple, um, I don't want to call them fills, they're just simple rhythmic responses in the gaps. It's, it's easy with something you know, it's harder with something you don't know, but when you get to a gig, obviously you don't know what solos your bandmates are going to play, so you're still listening for these places where you can interject simple rhythmic dialogue with the soloist. So that's what I'm doing here with the brushes. Again, Midnight Voyage, Michael Brecker, Jack DeJanet you'll hear on drums, who's, of course, one of the greatest of all time, and me warming up my hands on brushes. If you have questions, put it in the chat, I'll be with you shortly.
how can you make music playing along with the recording? You can do it. Listen for the soloist phrases. Try to find simple places to add rhythmically accurate rhythmic dialogue. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be crazy. It doesn't have to be Jack Dijonette shit. It could just be quarter notes. I usually warm up, frankly. I warm up first by playing some music. That's the end goal anyway. So I'm just getting my hands warmed up. Sometimes I say with brushes, sometimes with sticks. Usually a recording. Nah, yeah, usually a recording I know. I don't know, because I like playing off the solace phrases. So let's get caught up. I'm going to pull this out a little bit. And uh, hang on here. I'm going to grab a stool. Get caught up on some some questions. Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right. How do I practice splat? I got a mustache, but I need to shave. <laughs> uh, all right. Good questions. How do I practice splashing with the hi hat? I can show you that. Um, yeah, usually with my heel down, that's the key. It's really, really, really hard to splash the hi-hat with your heel up. Um, so we'll do that in a second. Heel down and then join late. I'm not talking about brush comping without interrupting your pattern or flow. Well, okay, so let's talk about these things. I'm going to move this around. I'm not sure. Yeah, let me see if I can get a, let me see if I can get a, a better um, angle of my hi-hat foot. It's feasible. Oh, yeah. Amazing. All right, so I'm going to play a little. I'm going to splash my hi-hat. You're going to see sort of the process, at least. All right? Um, 
heel down. You can even move this out of the way. You don't need this. All right. So. My heel is down. My entire foot is on the pedal. For me, when I splash it, I want to get the, uh, I actually want to get a long ring. I don't want it to sound like, um, you know, I don't want it to sound like marching band cymbals crashing. So that is where the cymbals are doing that. And that's a result of me letting all the pressure off of my foot. But if I tap my toes and I leave my foot down just a little bit, then the cymbals start ringing together. So a good thing to practice is, can you get a half note with your hi-hat foot? Or a whole note? So if I splash it on beat four, can I let it ring all the way till the next beat four? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That was, that was a bad one. One, two, three, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. So that's what I'm doing. Heel down, entire foot is on the pedal. Um, a couple other things that are really important with that is uh, you have to have your top cymbal has to be loose, so these felts cannot be clamping down on it like crazy. It can't, it can't, can't work that way. All right, so your top cymbal has, see how lo loose this thing is? So if you thought of this top cymbal as a ride cymbal, it's loose enough where you can play it and it sounds good. symbol has to be tilted also with the little screw on the bottom which this one is so there and I'll show you actually so actually if you push down sorry hope nobody's getting sick but seasick if I push down on these check this out you can actually see see how it doesn't line up suckers not flush right because the bottom t symbol is tilted, it basically looks like that. But that's the key to getting that sound, right? So if you want that sound, try half notes, then try whole notes. Oops. Comping, I guess, comping without losing the flow. I don't know. <laughs> um, so my basic brush pattern is, this is what I use for my sort of just, you know, the majority of things, tempos. So I guess without losing the flow, I try to find I try to find as many ways to break up the pattern as I can, adding accents or whatnot, um, without changing where my brushes are in the pattern. Right. So for instance, if my right hand, this is I, I do this. I do. Uh, what do I do? One, two, and three, four, and one. So, and one, I'm doing like a hit, and one, two. I'm dragging up to two and a push. And one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and one, two. 
So if I play an accent with my left on the and of one or the and of three, my right hand is trained so it doesn't break the pattern. It's another form of whatever you want to call independence or coordination, but it's just a matter of, you know, um, then it's easier to get in and out of my, of my pattern while, while playing some uh, other rhythms. Also, though, it's is, is, is probably most important because, because I'm dragging my brush up for two and four, which I teach a lot of students because it adds a much thicker sound, you know? I, I want to get long sounds with both of my hands, my right and my left. So my left is getting a long sound and my right is getting a long sound. Therefore, it feels full and legato and swinging. If my left hand is the only thing that I'm getting a long sound with and then my right hand is just ta -ting, ting playing all these vertical strokes and no long sounds, the minute my, your left hand stops or you play something with your left hand, it sounds super empty. Right, so for instance, I'll try to do it both ways. I don't know if I can, but so if I was to do, okay, no, no long sounds on my right hand. The minute I stop my right hand, it sounded hokey. So there, my left hand was the only thing respo responsible for the long. Now, with my right hand, I'm getting a long sound. So if I play a left accent, it doesn't sound as uh, empty. Right? So I think that's the key, and I think everybody's brush patterns are different. I think the key thing to work on is, can you play different rhythmic ideas with both your left and right brushes while keeping the other brush playing something static, something long, keeping the sound of that swish involved? I think that's, the, I think that's a, a pretty basic key, but it's not easy. So I, I think that a lot of people have different ways to achieve that. And that's some of the ways that I try to go about it. So, yeah, so that's, that's that. Anybody else have any questions or anything they're working on or listening to? What about up-tempo and 3-4 patterns? Uh, everybody's always, at, I should do, I need to, I need to shed my 3-4 patterns, to be honest with you. Up-tempo. Are you talking about brushes or sticks? Vashkar. Brushes? I can show you all. I don't know. Okay. Up tempo brushes. Oh, uh, Tane's seven, Swiss Army triplets. Oh, brushes. All right, I don't know Tane's, Tane's Swiss Army triplets in seven. Okay, let's try that in a second. So my up-tempo brush pattern is what John Riley showed me. I'm basically breaking up, that's not the best angle. Let me get a little higher. Basically breaking up my ride cymbal pattern into two different, um, two different hands. Two, four, two, four. Now, two, four, two, four, two, four. Notice, after beat two and four, I'm dragging the brush. This is the way I do it. I'm dra dragging the brush towards my hi-hat. Two, four, two, four. As I go faster, it's a push and a drag, push and a drag. So two, four, two, two. I'm basically playing quarter notes, right? One, uh, two, four. So it's like one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Where the two and the four, I get more fingers happening. My right. One, a three, a 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 one. A three, a one. So there I'm brushing away. So my left hand is brushing out. My right hand is brushing out.
so, uh, so that's basically what I do for up tempo brush pattern. I feel like I could do that. Maybe not all day. I've been shedding it, and I had definitely have not playing <laughs> been playing up tempo. Uh, you know, no gigs. I'm not. I, I don't know. I haven't been sitting in the basement just practicing. You know, shedding up tempo. But that's the pattern. Break up your ride simple pattern with two hands, and and knowing when you play something really fast. That's kind of your saving grace, you know, because you can play sticks, and when you get tired, piano solo, bass solo, whatever, man, go play, play with the brushes, you're playing with two hands, or the head with the brushes, you know, pacing yourself, but um, getting the long sounds, again, sweeping away from, from your body on the up-tempo to get those long sounds is really, really key. So, hey Mads, how you doing? Good to see everybody. Um... So now that there's some folks here tonight, uh, tonight I'm doing a live Q&A sort of hang with a good friend of mine, John McCaslin. John has a great blog. If you haven't checked out Four on the Floor, you got to go check out Four on the Floor. It's really, it's really a great, great, completely free um, blog site that's everything jazz drumming. He posts amazing inspiring things on there, you know, things to practice, things to listen to, rare recordings. Four on the Floor, uh, four on the floor blog, John McCaslin, great drummer and uh, a friend, and I'm going on his, I'm going to be joining him on his Instagram tonight at, uh, what time is it? 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, and we're going to be talking all things jazz drums. I'm going to uh, have a bunch of recordings queued up, ready to sort of listen to and talk about. So I'm sure we'll be talking about Mel Lewis, and we'll be talking about my my site, Jazz Drum Hang. We'll be we'll be listening to some things, and uh, I encourage you, either go to my Instagram, Chris Smith Jazz Drums, or John's Instagram, which is Four on the Floor, and join us and ask questions, be involved. That would be great to see any of you and all of you. So I miss some stuff. When comping for a soloist, how do you approach playing reactively versus responsively? For example, if a horn player plays a dotted eighth note rhythm and you mirror that back on the drum set. Okay. Good question. Let's talk about that. What else could you play to complement to and respond to that rhythmic idea? Yeah, right. Okay. Very good question, drummer boy. One, one, one drum. Very good question. So... Let's think of it as, I, I sometimes like the uh, analogy of music as a language, or at least jazz music as a language, and sometimes I don't. But for the sake of this question, let's think about it. If you're, if you're a very small child, or around small children, what is the first thing they do? Kids learn how to speak by mimicking what they hear. Mama, daddy, cookie, potty, rough, rough dog. Right? They're just mimicking what they hear. That's, that's basic, basic interaction and basic speech. So I kind of feel that way about when you hear somebody play something and you play it, play it back at them. Sometimes we call that Mickey Mousing. I don't know where that comes from, but I like the term. Really, it's, it's, not, it's not that you can't ever do that. There are, there are times, of course, but usually the more mature way to do that is to have a conversation as an adult. Somebody says, how are you doing? You say, I'm great, thank you. You know, what are you doing? I'm doing this. That's the type of interaction we want to be getting into. So the ways to, uh, you know, two ways I think to really hone this. Um, the first way is really by playing as much as possible with other people, right? And when you are playing with other people, um, a couple strategies I've used and still used, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing everything that's happening. I'm hearing everything that's happening in the group, but I'm really focusing in on sometimes one thing. So I'll really focus in on, you know, I'm, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not like I'm tuning people out, okay? I want to preface that, but I'm listening to the whole group and I'm really listening to the piano comping. And I'm really trying to get into what the piano is comping you know, what repetition, what rhythm, and then how can I create something around it? A response, not just copycat, right? So, boo da ah, boo da 
a go doom Buddha ka four Buddha ka it takes the other musicians playing usually some repetitions so that I know what's coming right other I mean that's that but but playing simple rhythmic ideas comping rhythms simple stuff out of the Riley book right but just one two or maybe three beats in length because usually you're not going to get you might get a measure or two, but usually something is happening, right? So finding those spots where you can have a response and play simple, don't think of it as fills, do not think of it as solo phrases. Think of it as simple comping phrases, right, to interject. Um, and I think thinking about the language is a good way to think about it. Now, at the beginning of this video, I was doing that with a recording I knew where I could, um, so this Michael Brecker song, the melody, Buddha, bida, booba, bida, boodoo, de, be, ba, be, Buddha. Great, great. Lots of space in the melody, long notes, short notes. So if I were to play along with that and think about this concept, even with the brushes. Buddha, bida. So, listening, listening to the people you're playing with, finding spaces and playing clear, simple rhythms. Practicing those clear, simple comping rhythms at a huge range of dynamics and at a huge range of tempos at home is the key. Because if you're only used to playing like the Riley, Riley comping thing at like one tempo at one volume, when you get to go play with somebody and it's not that tempo or that volume, it gets a little uncomfortable, right? So the other thing to do is listen, listen, listen closer to music. Sit down, headphones, vinyl, whatever the best quality recording you can find so that you can really hear what's going on and listen, listen to not just the drummer, but listen, almost I think it's more helpful sometimes to listen to the piano player, listen to Wynton Kelly, listen to like, you know, Red Garland, listen to Joey Calderazzo, listen to Mulgrew Miller, listen in, you know, to, to, to great compers, man, Hank Jones, Tommy Flanagan, listen to how they r rhythmically react to what's going on. So get out of drum world and listen to the piano, listen to the compers, listen to that, and then do that on the drums. And that's the interaction thing that we're talking about. It's not just playing back what you heard. You heard it. Sometimes showing that you heard it means you don't play anything at all. That's the mature. Let's see, like, sometimes somebody might play something, and sometimes my favorite parts of recordings where it's like the, 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 the I would have played something and the drummer did not react to what the soloist did and needed the comper and it's like, woo, it's just groove and it's like, it builds the tension for when they do react, right? So that's, that's a great question, it's a great topic, one that I'm passionate about. Um, I hope that helps, I hope uh, that helps if you're still here. Playing broken time in a trio setting, sure. Oh, yeah, Jeff Reed. We've talked about Jeff. Jeff is a great bass player. Chasing him around the room. Yeah. So, one other thing I'll say, like, you know, I said that I, I listen to everything that's going on in the group, but I focus in sometimes from time to time on, on different things. So, that's... I feel like if I'm only responding or reacting or really listening to one person in the group, it does feel like I may be chasing them around the room. But if I really listen to the soloist intently to try to maybe cap some of their phrases, and then I chill out on the next course and I listen more to the comper and how I can get into their thing, and I'm spreading around who I'm listening to and who I'm sort of interacting with, it's, it's like I'm getting into everybody's thing and everybody feels like I'm at some point connecting with them and at some point I'm not as connected with them because I'm not all up on their stuff, you know? So I think Jeff Reed is a great bass player and a very great guy and a friend of mine and that's a very good point. Um, so sometimes the, I mean, this is a 
huge bass general rule, but sometimes at the beginning of a soloist, I make focus more on what the comper is comping and how I can fit in or how I can give them something. And I don't always want to res respond. I want to instigate some stuff too. So what things can I instigate to make them respond to me? We're not just, I mean, you know, we don't have to just be the lowest, <laughs> you know, lowest person in the group where it's like, oh, we're just always responding to everybody else. Like, what can I play that makes them have to respond, right? And as the soloist maybe gets hotter, as we go more and more choruses, maybe that means the comper, piano, guitar, whatever, is starting to play more. So I go more with the solo, soloist. Listen more to the soloist, how I can push them, play off of their phrases. And then as it goes even further, more and more choruses, what more can I do to instigate, right? So sort of a general rule. It doesn't work for everything. It doesn't have to be nearly that contrived and thought out. But if we don't know, uh, have a plan, game plan, if we don't like how we interact, I think going with a game plan like that is a perfectly fine way to go until we're good enough where we don't have to think about it, right? Yeah, Brendan Brady. Yeah, uh, another one is, um, exactly, Jimmy Cobb on the Blackhawk. Another one that I've been listening to is... Um, uh, Joe Chambers on Mode for Joe. I love that record, and it's like <clears throat> a lot of. I mean, it's funny because a lot of times with students, I talk to them about changing up symbol textures, changing up colors, not being so static. But on Mode for Joe, Joe Chambers literally plays the same density, the same symbol, the same volume, the whole song, and it's freaking great. It's so it's so great, you know, like just playing time. One solo ends, another one begins. It doesn't get real soft. He just keeps this blanket of same symbol, same density, same volume to the whole tune, and it's killing. And it, and that's, I think that's a good way to go too, right? So let's see. I missed a couple questions. Hey, Darren. Roberto. Good to see everybody. Thanks, everybody, for stopping in. Broken time in a trio setting. Well, that's a good question, too. So I, I make it another example of broken time. Broken time in general, but in a trio setting especially, you know, um, I find that if you're playing broken time, meaning you're not playing as much repetition of a symbol beat or et cetera, you have to be super, super clear about what's on a downbeat and what's on an offbeat. And there cannot really be any question about it. Okay, so if you're leaving more space, broken time, we're leaving more space, we're not playing this repetition, there cannot be any second guessing of if I just played beat four or the and of four. That's when shit gets really, really uncomfortable and bad. So as a drummer, <clears throat> Because I play the beat so much, and I enjoy playing the beat so much, I find in my past life, and probably still, when it gets broken, I take too many liberties. So think of it as, uh, I think of it as babysitting, right? Like, if we're playing broken time, and the bass player isn't walking, and I don't have to play my cymbal beat, and we're talking trio, so maybe we're talking, you know, the, the most famous broken time trio probably would be Bill Evans' trio, right? All of them, but uh, the, 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 the first sort of great example of that being Paul Motion um, and Bill Evans, um, you know, and Scott LaFaro, like, somebody has to play the downbeat. A lot of times when I hear stuff that's broken, it gets, it's too broken, right? So I always say somebody has to stay home to watch the kids. So I feel that sometimes if the bass player is playing a lot of liberties and really enjoy playing, playing sparse, and the piano player or soloist or whoever is playing sparse, to me, playing broken time doesn't mean I still can't just play quarter notes or one and three. Like something really simple, but this is where the freaking downbeat is. Because if we don't have any anchor to anything that's going on with this is the downbeat, this is the downbeat, here comes beat one, boom, it just sounds like a vomit of rhythm, right? So the bass player should give the drummer space, to break it up. You see what I'm saying? And then during the same song, the drummer should give the bass player time to break it up. So if, if it's not my time to play really broken, I'm playing simple. 
Maybe I'm not playing my hi-hat. That gives, you know. So for instance, I'm gonna stick with the brushes. If I were to play Broken Time, missing some stuff here but that was me I wasn't singing a song somebody said alone together which is good but it's like it, it's more it's not about not playing a downbeat and it's not about it's not about playing not playing beat one two three or four it's about not playing as much shit around it that's what I think it is that's and so it's very clear like you could play one two three four and 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 the problem is people's subdivision isn't strong. And when you, when three people stop playing downbeats and nobody can subdivide consistent eighth notes or triplets, yeah, yeah, I mean, forget it, right? So somebody has to, to mind the store. That's, that's my take. I mean, it's not playing more and it's not playing more complicated. It's just simply playing less and more of the right stuff. Uh, okay. Ba -ba -da. Bar 2. Hey, Chris. How I can get better at feeling the offbeats at high tempos? Sure. Especially with the hi-hat and the bass drum. So you mean feeling, playing the offbeats at faster tempos with the hi-hat and bass drum? Just to clarify. Getting better at playing bass drum and hi-hat offbeats at faster tempos. I'm going to let you write back real quick, and I'm going to sing and play for a second, and then we'll talk about that uh, alone together. Uh, now I keep singing that Michael Brecker song, though. Booty day. Booty. 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 together I think it's more for a drummer it's about orchestrating and ma like I said making sure that it's very clear if you're playing a downbeat or an upbeat bar to feeling them all right so let me get I'm gonna move the camera for a second well I mean just like a lot of things frankly that I do at least um I, excuse me, I sing them, and I really do think that's the key. I know it makes some people uncomfortable, but that's the way it is. 
So I sing it and then I play it. So you said up tempo, but I mean we can go whatever. I won't start blazing fast, but so. Ah, 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 ah. So that the the offbeat has to be in my stick. One. Ah 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 ah. Ah 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 ah. Ah 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 ah. I'm playing my hi-hat now, actually with my heel, not super up, but up. I'm not playing heel down. So maybe practicing at slower tempo, practicing all the offbeats, on the hi-hat or the bass drum, and unison in your hands. Can you do it for, maybe you do it fast. Two notes, for me, two notes in a row and four notes in a row are easier than three notes in a row. But I got to shed three notes in a row, but I think... So find a record you like playing along with and do that for the whole song. One, two, three, four. <laughs> on your hi-hat or your bass drum, but I, I think with a lot of things, if my hands are not relaxed, if I'm tense, it kills my foot, it kills the whole flow. So doing it, just keeping this relaxed, as this becomes more relaxed, then you can start to bring in eighth notes in your cymbal, and I think that's a good way to go about it. So that's my thought there, if that makes sense. Actually, another thing that I wrote out this week is this thing. Uh, it's paradiddles between your right foot and your left hand. Yeah? So, right foot, bass drum, left hand, snare drum. The first one is left paradiddle and then a right paradiddle. And then the eighth note slides over once. So number two, the eighth note slid over, and where my downbeat was, you know, is now one eighth note over. But something like this, I think, is really good to help you feel the downbeats and the upbeats. You, uh, with your bass drum, you could do the same thing with your hi-hat. So it's paradiddle permutations, basically between your snare drum and either your right foot on the bass drum or your left foot on the hi-hat. So the first one is this. 
but it's really going to help you feel the upbeat. So... See if I missed anybody. Yeah, I guess anybody else, anything happening? Went to feather the bass drum. Well, pretty much feathering the bass drum constantly. Uh, I mean, you break it up, you're going to play figures with your bass drum. I really think like I, I, I really feather my bass drum all, all the time and uh, it comes and goes. So maybe I'll, I'll let you see what I do. I mean, you know, so I have this towel on the bass drum currently because it's, ugh, and this is not a very nice pedal. Anyway, let's see. Here's the bass drum. All right, so I'm going to play, and I'm going to see. You can just check it out, man. Just check out. Um, and then, yeah, Mel Records, of course. This is my bass drum feathering in and out. It'll give you some idea of at least what I do. Hopefully that helps you figure out your own thing at a variety of speeds and tempos. All right, so... bass drum and I'm playing figures, I usually almost always come back in either on two or four with my hi-hat. So my feet are in unison. I think that's one of the keys to getting in and out of feathering.
Oh, I'm all crooked. If you ever want to lose people during a live stream, man, just play some freaking bass drum. <laughs> but that's variety of tempos, styles, whatever. My, I'm feathering my bass drum constantly, it, it, either whole, half notes, quarter notes, whatever, but it's all, even the 12-8 uh, or Afro-Cuban stuff, it was playing like one and three really soft. It's always there. It's like that's, it can't not be there. It's like dancing, it's like dancing, man. Drumming is dancing. Drumming is dancing. And it takes your whole body and it definitely takes both your damn feet. So, I don't know, some, somebody that danced with one foot would look weird and they wouldn't be a very good dancer. And somebody that drums with one foot sounds weird and isn't a very good drummer. So, always keeping it involved, I think, is, is the key for sure. Figuring out what that means to you and it takes time. A few good Mel records. Have been looking to get more of his playing. I've never really checked out Mel Lewis, so I, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, some of my favorite Mel Lewis records. Um, that, I mean, <clears throat> okay, so let's see, that's a big question. Uh, well, check out a variety of things, right? So um, check out Art Pepper Plus 11. If you're new, if you, I'm assuming you're pretty new to Mel, so I'm gonna find things you can find easily. Art Pepper Plus 11, Jimmy Witherspoon Live at the Renaissance, Joe Lovano Tones, Shapes, and Colors. Uh, I mean, there's a billion of them that are all awesome. How about... Um, I'm going to list a lot of small group stuff because, you know, I think it's... I don't know. It's good to... If you're really... The big band stuff is what most people heard first, so let's go small group. So, um, there's a Marty Page trio record that is really nice. Yeah, Lost Art, Larry Davis. That's one of my favorites. I mean, that's like, uh, 80, uh, you know, late 80s Mel, which is awesome, Lost, Lost Art. That was sort of near the end of his life. That's a great record if you can find it. Um, the Lavana one is really good. Um... Mel Lewis and Friends is a great is a great record where Mel was a leader. Um, Thad Jones, Pepper Adams, that group. Um, Mel's on that studio recording, which is great. Um, Mel Torme, Swing Schubert Alley, which is for a different a little sort of different vibe with the large like a nonette or something, you know. Um, Eighty nine, yeah, actually. So Larry, good to see you. Yes, I remember like Oates and Mosca both talked to me about that session. And so Mel died in 1990. That session I think is from 89. I, I don't have it in front of me, but yes. And I know he was he was pretty. Uh, I think he was pretty sick during that recording. Um, I know Dur Pete Mel and Vernie's record. Um, oh, I'm blanking. Shoot. Pete Mel and Verne, a piano player. It's a trio record with Mel and Dennis Irwin. That was near sort of the end of his life also. But I, I think Mel was pretty sick during a lot of this stuff because he, he had cancer and he was going through chemo and so he was weak and he was nauseous and, you know. But uh, that's a, a place to start at least, you know. They're all good. I was listening to Sonny Stitt Blows the Blues. That's Mel. Um, that's great. It's all great. So I hope that gives you some stuff to check out. We're about out of time, and I got a split today. I have heard, yes. Um, so anybody that's still here, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good one. I, I mean, Mel and Dennis sound so good. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm well. I hope everybody else is well. I mentioned it earlier. I'll mention it again tonight. Uh, live stream. Live stream on my Instagram, Chris Smith Jazz Drums, and on Four on the Floor, John McCaslin. We're going to do a Instagram live where we're going to talk about drums, talk about Mel, talk about uh, play some recordings, talk about some recordings, all things jazz drums, jazz dr dorkery. Please stop in, um, ask us a question, say hello. You know, um, the Mel with Sonny Stitt. 
Sonny Stitt sounds so good. I mean, Sonny Stitt always sounds good, but he sounds especially good on that blues record. Um, I think Jimmy Rolls is playing piano, too. It's killing. Great rhythm section. Um, so stop by Instagram Live tonight. I'm going to shave before I get there so it doesn't look like I have a little middle school mustache. That's my goal for later today, before I see you all later. If you're not at Jazz Drum Hang, you got to go to Jazz Drum Hang. Free trial. You know, it's happening. There's a lot of good uh, lessons on there, information, rare videos, all sorts of stuff. I just, the last video I put up, um, I'm processing the new one that'll go up tomorrow. The one I put up a minute ago was, the last one was uh, about musical transitions. And I highlighted some of my favorite drummers that m some of you may know, some of you may not, depends where you live or whatever, but drummers that are not super famous. They're all living. They're all under the age of 50. They're all great drummers. Um, and I highlight some musical performances of them making really great, smart musical transitions to make the band sound better, to either get from a soloist to a soloist, or a melody to the solos, or solo to the melody, or solo to vocalist, or transition from time to free, you know, all sorts of things. Jimmy McBride is on there, um, Charles Gould, uh, Ted Poor, Kyle Poole, Pete Van Nostren. I just, uh, a bunch of clips of some of my favorite drummers that hopefully... Um, some of these guys you've never checked out, so you can go to Jazz Drum Hang, check out that video, all the videos, and be inspired to get better. So thanks for checking out this uh, live Q&A every Thursday, except next week, which is Christmas. I ain't going to be here. So until next time, go check out Jazz Drum Hang, jazzdrumhang.com. I hope everybody's well. I hope to see you tonight on Instagram. And that's it. Adios. Be safe. Wear a mask.